looks like we're at the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and begin. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And if you were here with us last week, welcome back. Uh, but if you weren't, welcome to our one-stop shop for everything Keysight and RF. For those that don't know me, my name is Mitchell. I'm the field engineer down in Southern California for the DOD. And last week we did our first part in the Back to Basics series. We did a segment on connector care and network analysis basics. If you were not able to attend, please send me an email and I'll forward you a recording of the event. It was a very great event. And today we are doing a segment on the basics of spectrum analysis. I mentioned this last week, but it's a good point to mention again. Um, we can only do so much in this one hour block. And if you really do want something more comprehensive and detailed, please send me an email. There's a lot of things we can do there. And if you have ideas for other lunch and learns that you would like to see different types of topics, you know, please, please email me about that too. And when things open up, we can actually bring in pizza and, and you guys can have lunch while we present. For now, for now though, that's not pass possible, obviously, with the uh, current events of the world. So for now, you guys can enjoy your virtual slices. <laughs> um, but today, I'm joined by our application engineer, Jason Gamola. Uh, I'll let Jason introduce himself and allow him to take the floor. Hello, everyone. Um, for those of you I didn't meet last week, um, nice to meet you virtually anyway. Um, apologize for the mask, but those are the rules these days. And I'm in the office today, as you can see from the, the background. Um, I just wanted to pull up one picture just to kind of give you a little background on my um, situation. Where did that go? There we go. I don't know if you guys can see this. Um, so, but, so this is what spectrum analysis used to mean to me. Um, and um, this picture is approved for public release, but it's um, somewhere outside of Las Vegas in the middle of the desert. Um, and this is. Um, uh, each one of those towers has an antenna on the top, and on the bottom of that antenna is a spectrum analyzer or signal analyzer. We'll get into those differences later. Um, so this was the setup I used to use to uh, do some radar system testing. Um, so I just wanted to show you some, just want to show off that picture because it's kind of cool. And now we'll get into the lecture. Let's hide that one. And um, just as a um, just thing to mention, this course is meant to be just either a refresher for people who have experience and haven't been in the lab in a while, or um, kind of entry level. This week has, I think, even less equations than, than the previous week, so we won't dive into the math. Um, if we have any questions, we can note those in the chat, and if they're um, complex, we can reply um, you know, through email, or if they're simple, we can answer them on the fly. Uh, but we, um, this is just meant to be a general overview and to kind of foster dialogue in both directions for us to get to know you and what your measurement challenges are and um, to, for us, for you to get some, um, you know, brought up to speed on the latest uh, inspector analysis. So this is a brief overview of what we're going to cover. We'll do um, a dive, a shallow dive into what is spectrum analysis, and then we'll cover the different parts. The parts shown in red are the ones we'll talk about, and um, then we'll go over some of the specifications, what to look for in a spectrum analyzer, and how to compare one to another, and some of the features. And um, I'm going to try to squeeze in a demo where it shows them on screen, just some real simple measurements, uh, and then we'll save time for some questions. One second, Jason. It looks like a lot of people aren't receiving any audio. Okay. Um, um, I'm receiving it on my end, but Leslie, is can you hear audio on your end? Uh, yes, I can. It doesn't appear that they've logged in with um, an audio device. Um, if they've come in with their computer, um, they should have an audio button on their their panel on the right hand side, their go to training panel. And if they open that up, it that. would either say computer audio or um, a phone call. Okay. Um, we are recording this, so I will send out the recording if you are having audio problems on your end. But um, that's not something I can help with. Um, it might be something that's if you are dialing in with a laptop, it might be a, a, a setting on your laptop. 
And th but they would be able to dial in their phone if, if it's not coming on their laptop? Uh, yes, that would have been in there. Um, they okay. can switch to a phone call if they, if they select that button, it should give them a phone number. Uh, Marianne does say it could be an, an Army IT issue too. Okay. With the platform. Okay, no worries. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat and see if I can send any help. But uh, we did want to put a poll in there real quick just to gauge everyone's experience level. So I'm just going to go ahead and share that. It'll give some people time to figure out audio as well. Okay. So this is just to kind of gauge the audience's experience level and um, understand where you guys are coming from. I see a few experts in here. That's uh, that's good. And then the rest are, uh, yeah, in the middle or no experience. That's great. The experts always have great questions to ask. Yeah, those are the ones that uh, that scare me with their questions. <laughs> um. Okay. I'll go ahead and close that poll. Hopefully that gave people time to figure out some audio issues. Uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat, see if I can help out in any way, but yeah, feel free to continue, Jason. Okay, yeah, um, we can move right along. So jump into what is a spectrum analysis. There we go, there we go. Um, basically, uh, Get that out of my way. Let's cover my notes. Okay, there we go. So it's a passive receiver, um, and it's typically done on on the end or, or on the end of a device or, or a subsystem. Um, it's not like a network analyzer where it's in and out. Um, so it, the benefit of that is it's minimally impactful to your your signal. Um, and what we're looking for in the simplest case is frequency versus amplitude. Uh, and this is covering the RF and microwave domain. I think now we go up to 110 gigahertz, or if we use frequency converters, we can go higher. Um, but it allows you to separate complex signals into um, into their base components or sine waves. Um, so some of the characteristics that we look for um, in these signals are whether or not they're repetitive um, and their, whether they're noise or noise-like signals and time varying. And these are the metrics that we can break apart and quantify and qualify with further uh, spectrum analysis. So if we talk about what we're looking for in with a spectrum analyzer, um, we are looking typically at a sine wave. Now, if we look at a sine wave on an oscilloscope, you'll see the picture over here on the left pointer on. Um, so this would be your typical oscilloscope screen. We're seeing um, uh, just amplitude over time. And you can see here it's a pulsed signal. Um, but you can, if you, you can see that it's uh, looks like a close to a single tone frequency, but you want to know if you wanted to know any further information about it, you'd have to look at it in the, in the frequency domain. So if we flip that to the frequency domain, in this direction we have frequency versus amplitude, um, you can see that the signal is actually made up of one fundamental tone and two of the harmonics. Um, and the spectrum analysis is what allows you to uh, devolve those components into uh, separate uh, measurements and um, perform the analysis on, on each one independently. So you can see from this that because the harmonic content of the signal is so high, that this signal is actually not just a fundamental tone, but it actually has some harmonic distortion. Um, some of the other measurements that we look at um, are with a traditional spectrum analyzer would be a spur search. Um, we have some, you could do a, a max hold transmitter test, and you can see here we're increasing the amplitude until we see the harmonic distortion. Um, uh, if we are looking at a modulated signal, we want to know about um, adjacent channel power, average channel power, 
and um, some of the modulation metrics. So you can see there's a, a vast array of measurements we can do with a spectrum analyzer. So next we want to get into uh, the different types of the spectrum analyzer. Now your traditional spectrum analyzer um, is done uh, with a filter that's sweeping over the frequency of interest. So it actually sweeps yeah. from your lowest frequency if, setting. Yeah, if you want to the your... sound, a, they gave a dollar number on the chat on the, on the, on the page. Um, you can hear, uh, I don't know if it's, I have some audio coming in. Somebody maybe yeah, needs yeah, listen to on I'm doing, yeah. hit Let's the mute talking. button. <laughs> um, is it green and bear? All right. <laughs> can we, Middle, can you see if we can mute that or mute all maybe? Is that me? Yeah, I'm going to see if I can handle that. Okay. I don't know where that is on the control. Anyway, um, we have a f the swept tuned analyzer is the traditional, um, the original version, the architecture of the spectrum analyzer. And the way this works is it actually sweeps um, with a filter over the, the band of interest and um, shows that to the display. So you're actually just showing that section at a time and it's um, stitching all the measurements together into one display. So this allows you to sweep a, a large range um, and only uh, measure the, the band of interest within the resolution bandwidth filter. But we'll dive into that more as we break it apart in later slides. Um, the next type of analyzer is an FFT analyzer. Um, and in this case, you have parallel filters um, overlapping, which allow you to get um, both uh, of the frequency, both of the simultaneous, both of the frequencies simultaneously um, without losing information in between from the time when you're switching from one to the other or sweeping from one to the other. Um, so this is done using uh, the FFT. So FFT is the discrete version of the Fourier transform, which allows you to switch from the time domain to the frequency domain. Um, and like I said, there's parallel filters. So there's actually multiple um, FFT analyzers um, sync together. And this is becoming uh, increasingly more popular with the uh, faster growth of the um, ADCs and digital signal processing that are becoming available. And I was actually looking into it and some of this stuff's getting pretty high in frequency. So it's um, becoming pretty easy to um, pack into these spectrum analyzers. And um, that's how we're able to uh, give you the wider instantaneous bandwidth and take the wider measurements. So um, if we're going to look at how the back to the swept tuned receiver, this was the, the first architecture I showed. Um, this slide goes into how this is done. Uh, and this is the typical uh, frequency bandwidth that you can see. Uh, you see frequency on the x-axis and amplitude on the y. So if we had a fundamental frequency um, and we're sweeping the resolution bandwidth over that frequency, um, some of the other components that we would pick up would be the phase noise of that signal, uh, which is all of the noise associated with the um, with that signal, and and the whoa. Um, can you guys still hear me? Okay. My mute button's going yeah, crazy. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, next, we'd see the harmonic content, and as the and the as well as the subharmonic context content from the signal being mixed and multiplied up. So, all of these things put together, and then as we sweep the um, filter over, you can actually see this see each of these components individually as it's um, as the filter swept over. So if you were to measure this with a power sensor, if you were to just hook a power sensor and um, plug it into the signal at this frequency, um, you would actually gather the amplitude contribution from each of the, the subharmonics, the fundamental, the spurs, the noise, random noise, and um, the harmonic spur, as well as all the broadband noise. So all of that gets bundled up together and packaged and sent to your power meter. Um, okay, now jumping to 
um, the, some terminology. So when we say spectrum analyzer, the um, the truer, truer, more the closer definition to that is the the swept tuned spectrum analyzer that just gives you amplitude versus frequency. Um, and this is more more known as the um, kind of older style of spectrum analyzer. Now, if we talk about the next one, which is a vector signal analyzer or VSA, um, the old definition of this was this was uh, not a swept instrument, but a would be set at uh, a single frequency, and then it would have a wider um, IF bandwidth, so you could measure um, in the order of megahertz um, how wide the signal was, and you could measure you could measure it all instantaneously using the FFT um, analyzers that we mentioned previously. So this can give you um, the phase in addition to the magnitude of the input signal, which will allow you to make measurements such as error vector magnitude. Um, you can code the code domain power and um, some of the other modulation metrics that involve the more complex measurements, digital signals and the processing. Now, um, if we stuff a vector signal analyzer inside of a spectrum analyzer, we give it a new term and we call it a signal analyzer. So that's why if you look at the Keysight um, you know, X series of PXA or UXA, it says uh, signal analyzer, not spectrum analyzer on it now. And so that's indicating that it can measure phase um, and vector signals in addition to the traditional spectrum analysis. <clears throat> uh, okay, so uh, we kind of glossed over this earlier, but we'll just show a screenshot. Um, this is the important um, terminology. When I say span, we're talking about the x-axis. So this is the start frequency to the stop frequency of the frequency domain measurement in question. Um, and then amplitude, obviously, is your um, y-axis. And this is uh, spectrum analyzer is usually measured in dBm, which is um, decibel related to one milliwatt. Uh, you can, can you can change that if you were doing another type of measurement. Some of the field strength measurements are in different units, microvolts and whatnot. They're selectable in, in most of the um, analyzers. But the default setup is dBm over versus frequency. Okay, I think M middle has a pull a poll for us. So if we're ready for that. Yeah, so I have some polls in here that kind of like quizzes, but it's not really to quiz you guys. It's kind of get some details to stick and figure to be something nice. This one's not nearly as fun as the last one. Yeah, <laughs> puns are always fun. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. Look like most most of the um, yep. answers are coming in at, at vector. So vector signal analyzer. That's cool. It's good information to have. And no logic analyzers. So that's <laughs> also good information yeah. to have. Yeah. So yeah, VSA is the correct. <laughs> okay. So um, now we've talked a little bit about what is spectrum analyzer. We'll move into the block diagrams of um, traditional spectrum analyzers and modern signal analyzers. So this is how they kind of used to look. Um, and we'll break these components apart and talk briefly about each each um, piece. Excuse me. OK. Um, so basically, it is um, this architecture is called a super heterodyne. Um, mixer or super heterodyne receiver. And heterodyne just means to mix and super means above super audio. So above the audio frequency range is what they're referring to. So you can see the input signal comes in over here and it's um, attenuated if need be. Um, then you have a pre-selector filter and then it hits a mixer. Um, this mixer has three inputs. One is the RF, one is the local oscillator, which is kind of the Think of it as the um, the clock. Uh, if you were going to make a digital analog to that, um, so it, the sum and difference of that mixer of the LO versus the input signal is um, mixed down to give you an IF frequency, uh, and that is then amplitude amp, amplified through the IF gain amplifier and filtered. 
then um, run through another log amplifier, run through a detector, filter it again, and then send out to your um, analog to digital uh, display processor and then the display. And the um, LO is synced to that, so as you're sweeping across, um, the LO is the one that's actually doing the sweeping. So that's um, uh, how the display is all put together in the end. Um, nowadays, oh, okay, so this is a the line, this is the uh, heritage, the swept spectrum analyzer um, Keysight portfolio, or I guess Agilent or um, HP. I don't think Keysight actually made a swept version. Now the new uh, the new way things are doing or being done in the um, signal analyzers is to use a digital IF portion. So it's the same basic front end. Um, and then after the logarithm amplifier, you have, we put a 14-bit ADC, so digitize it there. And then uh, we use the FFT processing to do the digital filtering um, and ampl amplifier and um, then the, de the digital detector. So what this allows us many um, key improvements over the old, old style. Uh, one of them is that you can do many different trace detection types on the same signal. Um, the other is the, just the dynamic range, which I think is probably the most valuable is it allows you to do the, uh, some processing on the signal to get a lot more um, uh, range, a lot more uh, amplitude change from the, the top end to the low end, which is dynamic range. So I covered this briefly, but this is how the, um, the mixer works. If we have the IF signal and your LO, and we mix together, we actually get the sum and the difference of that. Um, and you typically just pick one of them and then filter out the other one. So um, that's what the IF bandwidth filter is for, is to remove the, um, the difference in this case. Um, so one of the settings that you'll see on the spectrum analyzer is called the resolution bandwidth, and that actually refers to this um, IF bandwidth or resolution bandwidth filter. And most of the time nowadays, you can just leave it in auto and, it, and you'll get what you want. However, if, you, if um, you're trying to fine tune your, your display or if you have multiple signals together, like in this case, we had two, two input signals close together and we set the resolution bandwidth filter to wide, um, your display would just show the uh, sum of those two signals because they're not um, filtered out as, they're not resolved independently as the filter's sweeping through. So if we crank it down a notch, you can start to see the smaller signal um, having an input to the display, uh, but you still can't see that there's two individual signals there. So uh, if we crank it down till it's narrow enough, where the resolution of the filter is smaller than the separation of the signals, you can actually see that there's two independent signals resolved. Now, the consequence of this is going to be um, it's the sweep will want to slow down to allow for the slower filter because it's filtering a smaller amount of frequency information as it's stepping across the frequency. So. Um, it will be slower. However, the benefit of that, it will, it will obviously give you an increased resolution and it will lower the noise floor as it's taking in less, um, less noise through the filter. Um, next step in the chain is the envelope detector. Um, you can think of this as a, as a diode, um, but this is what passes the signal uh, and converts it from a sine wave to a um, positive uh, voltage. So this, uh, at this point, we lose the um, frequency or the phase information. Um, and we just keep the spectral component. So um, next we'll talk briefly about how um, once it's detect once it's passed to the detector, how it the points are um, are gathered together and, and basically uh, um, quantified. So depending on how you have the detector set, 
it will um, group together all of the points and then um, the default value is the RMS. So it will bucket them all those samples together in one bin and um, provide the RMS value for that point. So this can be important if you're um, just to know that it, it is an average of average values of those samples within that bin. Now your um, the last filter before the display is called the video bandwidth filter, um, and this one is actually has the equivalent function of averaging the trace um, over the over the sweep period. So if you um, leave this alone, it will um, maybe provide a um, less averaging in in and get you a faster sweep, but if you slow it down and allow it to provide more um, uh, more averaging, then you can actually filter out some of the noise of your signal, which will allow some of the close to noise, um, low amplitude signals to um, to pop out of the noise. So if you have a, um, a small variation uh, in the the noise, it can you can filter that out. Um, are there any questions before we jump into the next section? I'm hoping to get to uh, the demo. Okay. Um, question came in from Will. It says, can you explain the following? Ooh, it just disappeared. Um, hold on one second. I lost that chat. There we go. Give me one second, I just lost that. Um, scrolling down. Okay, ooh, that's a long question. Okay, um, displaying a pulsed RF signal, does it not show the full amplitude of the signal? Um, so the, the reason for that is called the pulse desensitization. Um, and it has to do with uh, the settings of the um, resolution bandwidth, and it's actually characterized. Um, I don't remember the actual equation, but you can characterize that and, and put that back together and um, add that up to mathematically get to the full amplitude of the signal. That's possibly, I think pulse measurement is probably um, a good future topic where we can dive into those those measurements, but that's, um, I'll, and I'll, I can demonstrate that uh, on the, in the demo if we get there. So we'll, you have to circle back to that to get a, to dive deep into that. So good question, um, but we will have to save that one to our future topic to get a full answer. Um, so now we're going to talk briefly about the key specifications of the spectrum analyzer. Um, some of them are obvious, like frequency range, um, and uh, some of them are less obvious. So what makes the spectrum analyzer work for you? Uh, obviously, it needs to be high enough in frequency range, minimum and maximum. Some of them go lower just due to the front end circuitry. Um, and amplitude range, this is another key distinguishing factor between the, the low end and the high end. Um, not so much low end and the high end um, uh, spectrum analyzers is what I'm saying. Um, most of them go fairly uh, about the same. They're all about one watt or 30 dBm uh, with, on the on the high end of the amplitude scale. But the, it's the the low end. How low can you actually get a measurement? And that has to do with the dynamic range of the system, and that is quantified, um, and then that varies greatly by um, the grade of the of the equipment. So there's a lot can be done to measure low level signals. Um, some of them can only see uh, minus 100 dBm, or some of the better ones can see minus 170 something dBm signals, so very low amplitude signals. Um, next is the resolution. Uh, again, I can I can download a spectrum analyzer application for my phone, and um, you can see a few signals, but you can't see the you know I won't see 170 dBm negative 170 dBm, and I won't see uh, much resolution. Obviously, the frequency is going to be limited. Um, as well as 
the accuracy. Um, just a note on what we mean by uh, frequency accuracy. So in our Keysight data sheets, we, we uh, rigidly specify how the, the readout comes to be known. So there's uncertainty in each of the elements of the measurement, so they are quantified here. But the key takeaway from this is that um, your span and resolution bandwidth are your main factors, and you can see that um, based on the, if you put together this equation. Um, so if you're trying to increase your uh, frequency readout accuracy, the lower the span and lower the resolution bandwidth that you can get away with uh, will provide a less uncertainty. And also um, a lot of modern spectrum analyzers, certainly the Keysight ones, include an internal frequency counter, which can be done um, in our case through the, the, the marker menu. You can actually uh, set it, set the marker as a frequency counter and this will, um, in this example case, reduce your uncertainty again by another factor of four. Okay, um, did I miss anything there? So um, we mentioned this briefly, now we'll talk about f the phase noise and how that can um, affect your signal. So basically phase noise is um, a quantifiable measure that demonstrate that um, this, that shows you how wide this skirt on this, um, this um, signal would be. Now ideally, if you had a um, fundamental signal, it would just be a straight line uh, right at your frequency. But in reality, once you add in um, the components of the, that make up that signal, um, this um, noise starts to appear on the um, both sides of the signal. Now they're symmetric, uh, but depending on the quality of the how the signal is generated, it, it can have a real input impact on how wide um, the skirt is and also how high. So if I were trying to measure uh, the signal, a small signal adjacent to my fundamental signal, the phase noise of that signal would um, play a role on whether you can actually uh, see that signal or whether it's masked. So um, that phase noise is typically um, determined by your signal generation chain. Uh, in this case, in the case of a signal analyzer, it would be your local oscillator or whatever you use to um, feed the mixer so and that passes throughout the entire chain so if you have a bad local oscillator um, you'll see this noise and this noise will get passed through to every signal so um, it will be the key limiting factor in for your dynamic range for your um, close-in signals um, and phase noise is another good topic for uh, another hour we have um, many different ways to measure and quantify that and um, show the impacts of that. Um, okay, so now we're gonna jump into the uh, se selectivity and the uh, items shown in red are the ones that uh, govern the selectivity. Um, so the, um, I'm sorry, the sensitivity. So the sensitivity is uh, how well can the receiver or the signal analyzer measure uh, small signals. So uh, a perfect receiver would um, not add any noise to the signal and just measure the signal as is, but in reality, um, all of the individual components add, add their own noise and um, that noise gets added up into your measurement. So it increases your uncertainty and it um, brings up the noise floor of your measurement. Um, yeah. So the specification for sensitivity is, uh, is called DANL, or displayed average noise level. It's basically just a way to quantify um, the noise floor of a signal and it's given over a bandwidth. So it's, it's your best case sensitivity for a specific bandwidth. So uh, in the general sense, when comparing spectrum analyzers, the lower the lower DANL or lower noise floor, the better, and that will allow you to um, 
achieve the measurement of the lowest level signals. And you won't be able to measure a signal um, below your DANL unless you're doing some um, fancy processing. So, um, like I said, DANL is um, bandwidth dependent. So, uh, you'll if you, by narrowing your resolution bandwidth, you can um, increase the the DANL or the or another way of saying that is to lower your noise floor. So if you had a 100 kilohertz resolution bandwidth, you could just barely see the the noise is is just barely below the um, peak amplitude of the signal. And if you crank it down, you can see that the the signal amplitude stays the same, but the noise level goes down. So in that noise level change, um, is going to be a 10 log um, factor of your change. So your old versus your new. I mean, sorry, 10 log of your new versus your old. Um, and I touched on this a couple times, but here's a chart that actually shows what I was talking about. So dynamic range is going to be a measure of your largest signal to your smallest signal, and uh, how much of that can you actually measure. So um, you can see if we didn't have the, the um, small signals, the dynamic range would be your maximum to your noise floor. Um, but this is an important metric in a receiver. Uh, so in the spectrum analyzer being a receiver, this is one of the quantifiable metrics that um, allow you to compare one to another. Um, okay, and this is just, um, just a graph showing the relationship between the resolution bandwidth and the DANL, just showing that um, as the uh, power goes up and the um, DANL goes down, uh, that so for each resolution bandwidth, the, this line gets shifted lower in this in this direction. So I think it's just just trying to show that um, the relationship between that resolution filter resolution bandwidth filter settings. Next is showing um, the effect of using the mixer. And so one of the side um, effects of, of using a mixer is that it's going to pass through um, all of your, your signal as well as the um, less than ideal products um, created by the sum and the difference. So the uh, distortion will add. Um, and your, uh, your distortion products will add, and your fundamental will uh, typically not. So because mixers are nonlinear, um, this is uh, the internal distortion of the mixer. So this is just something um, to see if you're, that you can see manifest in your uh, measurements if your filtering is not done carefully. So this is the importance of the having a pre-selected front end in your signal analyzer. Um, and if you don't have that pre-selector, then these mixer uh, distortion products won't be won't be removed adequately and may impair your measurement. Um, so now, if we're moving to um, quantifying the distortion of a device, one of the ways to do that is uh, with the spectrum analyzer. We take a um, a measure of the nonlinear behavior, we call that the um, third order intercept. And uh, so this is tough to do quickly, but uh, we take the two tones, two separate tones, um, usually separated by a few megahertz, and we measure the um, mixer product, which would be the um, tones um, summing and um, uh, so it's the frequency of the product of the first, the F2 minus the uh, amplitude of F1 uh, shows up as your third order product. And the measurement, you would take the delta between the amplitude of the F2 and the amplitude of the um, product, and that's a quantifiable metric of your uh, third order intercept. 
um, which can tell you how distorted or in how far distorted is your um, amplitude. And here we're looking for um, the signal to distortion curves of the mixer level. So your um, this is shown on a different graph. The the uh, input from the I'm sorry the the slide the previous slide shown on a different graph. So as you increase um, the third order product, um, we quantify the performance of the amplifier or the nonlinearities of the uh, mixer. I'm sorry, excuse me. Give me one second. This is heavy to do quickly. Okay, now we'll move on to the, um, let's see. This is just showing the optimum settings for your receiver. Um, or in this case, your spectrum analyzer. So you want your um, displayed average noise level to be, uh, that's gonna govern your low end of your measurement and your um, third order intercept is gonna govern the high order, high end of your measurement. So you wanna be in the sweet spot in terms of um, power input at the mixer and your distortion level. Uh, okay. So putting all that together, um, we can see that the um, increasing the resolution bandwidth has the effect on um, all of these components, your maximum level um, and your mixer compression has an input, your third order distortion, um, and then they're all gonna affect your dynamic range. Um, okay, so for actually measuring, if we're specifying the amplitude accuracy, um, one of the things to point out is that there's actually two different measurements. One would be the absolute amplitude, but this would be uh, a measurement in dBm, so it's 30 dBm or zero dBm, um, or your relative, which would be um, in this, say, a harmonic relative to this peak, we'd say it's um, in dBc, or decibel relative to the carrier. So this um, is not the same measurement and it's an important uh, distinction to know. And you'll see that you actually see your markers change on your device when you um, get to that um, measurement setting. <sighs> Some amplitudes, just a sample characteristic of our UXA line. Some amplitude uh, accuracy specifications. So we can see we specify them that they're accurate to plus or minus point 24 dB. Now there are ways to increase that um, with calibration and other routines. So that's another uh, possible topic. It's actual, or we could do power measurements or amplitude measurements. Um, okay, I think we'll jump through that and I think take up another poll real quick and um, I think we're on track. Getting caught up. So, so this is going back to when Jason was talking about the Daniel and reduce and how to reduce it by using the RBW. Snack it a few times is always a good uh, <laughs> turning it off and the back on. <laughs> but yeah, it looks like majority of us got it right. It, it is uh, decreasing the resolution bandwidth will allow you to reduce the Danil and see signals that maybe got drowned out by uh, the noise floor. Thank you guys. I'm going to close that pull out. Okay. Um... Just have a few quick slides to get through and then we'll pull up uh, a spectrum analyzer hopefully and get get to some real measurements um, these are some of the uh, demos which we could could do at a later date if we had more time um, 
we could play with each of the settings and, and display what happens as you change the RBW, um, as you change this span, as you, you can manually change the um, input mixer settings and see, observe the distortion and the um, third order intercept effect on the measurement. You can see some spurs. Um, okay, jump through that. Yeah, and here again, this would be what it would look like. Um, so, like I said, the um, Danel is the measurement of the noise floor. Some of our spectrum analyzers have a feature called noise floor extension, which is a, an adaptive um, digital signal processing that allows the noise floor to actually be subtracted um, down even lower. That's a good uh, good one for a demo. If we have time for that. Um, jump ahead okay so the next one thing I wanted to cover um, so if you're using a swept tuned analyzer in typical um, swept mode uh, as the resolution bandwidth filter is sweeping across frequency um, it's only capturing the information that's in that resolution bandwidth filter so if I am sweeping here but I had an intermittent signal that just pops up here um, it wouldn't be seen, and when by the time the filter's over here, that that signal's gone. Um, that information doesn't get captured, so uh, that's why one of the drawbacks to the swept tune mode is that uh, it doesn't always capture the intermittent signals, and there's actually lost information um, that's not captured between the sweeps. So if we go to the um, swept FFT mode, um, the way that's done is it has a narrower bandwidth that it can process, but it will process all of that. Um, it will acquire it and then process it um, synchronously. So it'll take your, say, 10 megahertz um, snapshot, uh, and then it will go and process that information, and then it will move to the next area, next 10 megahertz, acquire it, and process it. So uh, the benefit of that is it will capture all of the information within that bandwidth, which um, we refer to as the instantaneous bandwidth. And then um, while it's thinking, it will uh, lose the, the next frequency information, next bit of frequency information. Um, now the, the improvement to that is to have a wider acquisition bandwidth, um, and that's the direction that um, they're heading and so this would be a real-time uh, FFT uh, analyzer so this is actually continuous and gap free so within your instantaneous bandwidth from start to stop you can capture all of the information um, and nothing is lost during processing so the benefit of this is that you don't miss the signals so if you had a signal pop up like a spur or an intermittent um, uh, rogue signal um, it would show up and um, so if you're comparing the swept tuned analyzer versus the um, real time uh, and you had a noisy bandwidth, uh, a noisy uh, frequency range of interest, one of the ways you could do that would be to set a max hold and you could see what pops up, but you won't be able to devolve the information into um, independent signals until you, um, dive into it with a real-time spectrum analyzer. Um, also, some of the things like we mentioned would be um, dissecting the signal's modulation characteristics. Um, we can also measure noise figure. Um, we can do pulse analysis and uh, phase noise measurements in a modern spectrum analyzer. Um, and we can go to 110 gigahertz. And let's see, a summary. Okay, so wrapping that up and then I will allow a few minutes for the demo and then a few minutes for questions and uh, we'll figure out what to do next after that. So in summary, this is the general um, block diagram of the modern, of the swept tune spectrum analyzer. Um, the modern spectrum analyzer replaces this envelope detector and video filter with a digital, digital version, which retains the um, I and Q information. Uh, which is phase and amplitude. 
uh, we covered the parts. And okay, now I think we can go to the demo. So I'm going to pull up uh, a screen from our UXA. Uh, let me get this out of here. Oh, I can't see. Okay, so you guys can see my UXA screen, I hope. And too many things in the way. Uh, here we have already have it set to um, uh, the center frequency of interest. But that's all I did. This was basically just a preset um, bringing the signal up. If I were to turn a signal on, uh -oh. what happened? On the wrong one. Nope. Uh, center. Okay, give me one sec. RF on. Oh, there we go. Okay, so signal on. Um, we can see here that this is just a regular CW signal, super easy to measure. Um, drop a mar marker already pops up on it, tells us it's right at two gigahertz and gives us the amplitude. Um, so this is your, um, probably the simplest measurement you ever make. Uh, you could get, um, drop another marker on it and your noise and get your dynamic range or your um, uh, relative difference, relative amplitude. Um, but if the signal were to um, modulate or change, you could see how um, we don't get a good picture of the signal. Now we could slow the signal down, we could slow the sweep time down and, um, and maybe capture some of the components of the signal. Um, one of the things we could do is add another trace on there um, and do a max hold so we could see at least where the signal is, is popping up. Um, but you can see for these, uh, so it looks to me like it's changing in frequency, the amplitude. Uh, so that suggests some frequency modulation. Uh, it's popping up and down so you can see it's pulsed, but you can't quite get a good metric for it. Um, so one of the, the ways we can look at it is with a real-time spectrum analyzer. So let's we'll change tabs here. I already have this one set up. Um, so here is this is a gap-free uh, measurement of this signal, and uh, you can see the signal changing in amplitude in real time. Um, I think if you were to look at this on the actual screen, you could actually see the frequency movement. Uh, the network bandwidth of this presentation is slowing down the video, so you can't see the actual um, amplitude sweeping from left to right. Um, but you'll just have to take my word if you were looking at the actual screen, you could see um, the actual peak starting over here at two gigahertz and then sweeping uh, up by five megahertz and moving back and forth. Uh, and you can see uh, that the information is, is pulsed. So if we were to look at uh, a different layout in the real-time spectrum analyzer, we can get all these measurements on one screen. Um, and we can see the pulses individual pulses. Um, we can see that they're modulating in amplitude. Um, so this here is a time domain. Since we have the FFT information, um, we have time versus amplitude. Um, and then this is a simplified frequency versus amplitude measurement. And you can see that there's a, um, that the frequency is spread over uh, almost half of, a, half of a block, which is in this case, five, uh, five megahertz frequency modulation, and then putting the information together just to see visually, um, we can see it here on the spectrogram that it is um, a pulsed measurement uh, spread over frequency and, um, and ampl with amplitude varying in time. Um, do we have any questions? Did any questions come through? I haven't been monitoring the chat. Yeah, there's one in there. And also while people are putting in questions, I'm gonna put up a a quick poll for you guys to take. Um, and there's a question in the chat, Jason, I don't know if you can see it. Um, but we can uh, we can address that while people are taking. Okay, yeah, all right. Okay. Um, 
What would your recommendation be if the noise floor is significantly greater when the SA is plugged into the same power source as the device being measured? Um, so it sounds like you're having an impact of the, no the noise floor due to your power source. Um, it sounds like it could be a ground loop or also your um, power conditioning. Um, I've heard of this uh, happening in, in other labs and they have the solution is to use the specific power conditioning um, uh, power strip, kind of a higher end um, power strip with a capacitive filter in the front. It filters the, that, um, but I haven't pers personally had to deal with this. Um, I would assume you could try a different uh, location for the, uh, to plug the spectrum analyzer in and characterize the, the unit itself and, ass and assess whether the unit is functioning as, as desired. Uh, and I'm also curious if it's, frequency specific if it, or if it's just um, one range. Yeah, feel free to come off mute as well if you guys want to answer further questions. Um, so I was hoping that, um, that this quick little demo would show uh, some of the differences between the swept spectrum analysis and the um, real-time FFT spectrum analysis. Um, and, um, and just note that the, this real-time spectrum analysis is now uh, is, is much more available in even the handheld, um, handheld units. So it's not just a high-end UXA. Um, Um, component. Let's see, let me get my modulation off. Let's see. Oh, uh, let's see. Great question. Okay. Um, I'll call. Um, do I need one more? Yeah, a power line filter could work. Is the answer to that? Um, what else? Are there any other questions? I'm from last week. Um, I don't know what this uh, deoxid is, um, but if unless it's specifically for connectors, uh, the typical recommendation we give is just to use a high um, high concentration of uh, uh, alcohol, the like 99% or higher, so that it evaporates cleanly and doesn't leave a, a film on the connectors. Um, if the the oxid I'm assuming is to to remove oxidization, so if that if only if that were a specific product meant for connectors, would I touch it on my three thousand uh, dollar one millimeter connector? That's my official answer. Okay, are there any other questions on the slides? I think I know I breezed through some of that. Um, uh, I'm glad we will be sending our mixer afterwards. Okay. Yes. Here's just a quick overview of our PXA line um, and where the, the real time kicks in there. It's also in our handheld versions, like I mentioned. Um, this is the block diagram showing uh, with the previous. Um, analog IF, and then um, with the newer one, how we switch to the um, digital IF. Um, I think that's about all I got, unless we dive hey, into some more demos. Yeah, if you guys have questions, well, me and Jason will stick around for a bit and, and feel free to ask them. You can come off mute as well. Um, yeah, again, two, two quick things. When you guys leave, you'll see an evaluation 
and feel free to put any sort of topics that you guys want to see in the future, lunch and learns. And hopefully if the COVID situation improves, you know, we can be at your facilities. You can guys have hands-on experience with a lot of these equipment. Um, and we can go into more detail about some of the things you guys are interested in. So thank you all for joining us. We'll be doing more sometime in the future. And, and it was really a pleasure having all you folks here. And again, feel free to ask questions. Jason and I will be here hanging out. You'll receive yeah, a thanks. recording of the event after after it's all said and done and feel free to send that to your teammates and colleagues and and yeah um yeah thank you guys very much i appreciate your time uh, i know these days it's hard to uh sit through another remote meeting so i i do appreciate it and i hope you guys got something out of this um thanks for the good questions uh we'll get back to you an email um maybe with some better answers. <laughs>